Welcome back to the next episode of Fireside Chirps. Today we'll be diving into the Coalition for the Delaware River's recently released DEIJ toolkit. But before we get into that, let's go around and introduce ourselves. Sandra, would you like to start? Put your name, your position in the organization, and one thing that you're looking forward to visiting or doing after the coronavirus social distancing is released a little bit. Yeah, thanks Olivia. Hey everybody, I'm Sandra Miola. I'm the director of the Coalition for the Delaware River Watershed in New Jersey Audubon's Government Relations Department. And I am really looking forward to going back down to Cape May. It's really tough, um, you know, especially as we enter in the warmer months uh, to not be able to go and visit our favorite restaurants and enjoy um, all the wonderful things that Cape May has to offer. I actually spent my childhood summers down there. My parents had a little motel that they, well, my grandparents had a little motel that they managed. So it's definitely um, probably my favorite place on, in New Jersey, if not on earth. <laughs> so um, shout out to the Lobster House. Can't wait to be back there. And although I'm pretty sure I can take a drive there and get takeout if I really wanted to, I am very excited for them to be officially open, um, which will hopefully be soon, so. Great, and Drew? Hi, uh, Drew Tompkins, Director of Policy with New Jersey Audubon's Government Relations Department. And I'm gonna sneak in kind of a twofer. Uh, I'm gonna say I really wanna get back to Asbury Park, um, which is probably my favorite shore town um, in New Jersey. And specifically, um, beyond all the great attractions that Asbury has, all the really great bars and restaurants um, that I wanna you know, visit, I also wanna get to a uh, concert at the Stone Pony. Um, so I'd love to see, you know, Stone Pony, of course, brings great music and has for a very long time to New Jersey. Um, and this, you know, maybe my first year, uh, since I moved to New Jersey five years ago that I, uh, will not see a concert at the Stone Pony, at least one. So that's a uh, kind of sad, uh, you know, normally get to the summer stage at least once, if not twice a year and then see one or two inside shows as well. So it's a, great venue and, you know, looking to get back and support musicians um, and all the people who I think have helped so many of us get through these times as well uh, through their art. So that's mine. Awesome. And my name is Libby Lorne. I'm the engagement coordinator with the Coalition for the Delaware River Watershed, which is part of the Government Relations Department of New Jersey Audubon. And one thing I'm looking forward to is being able to go camping again with my friends. I've been socially distancing away from them. So once we can all get back together, I'd love to hang out in a forest with them all. I'm pretty open to whatever state park or forest we go to though. <laughs> Great. And with that, Drew will give us a little bit of state and federal policy updates. Thanks, Olivia. Yeah, so, you know, as we like to do on Fireside Chirps, we want to just give you guys a little bit of update about what's going on, uh, both at the state and federal level as we move forward. Um, at the federal level, we'll start with that because it's going to be pretty quick. We're still in really a wait and see mode. Um, the House has been moving quite a few pieces of legislation. Um, they moved another really big uh, stimulus bill, but that, you know, has been signal to have no chance in the Senate. So it's not really going anywhere. They also passed some amendments to the Paycheck Protection Program um, late last week. Um, but again, those, you know, we'll have to see if they go anywhere in the Senate right now. That's where the holdup is. Um, you know, whether or not the Senate's gonna move on anything as well as whether the president uh, will support it. So, you know, we'll continue to keep you updated there um, as we have more information. Now at the state level, there is quite a bit that has been happening. Um, thankfully, cases have been and continuing to decrease, although we still have a significant amount of cases and you know, significant amount of deaths every day, but they are decreasing, which is a good sign. Um, and we are moving forward with some reopening. You know, we've seen parks reopen. Um, we've seen beaches reopen. We're starting to see uh, other outdoor activities reopen. Batting cages were open. Golf courses, of course, were open with relaxed rules. Um, and then we're gonna be seeing over the next few days uh, and weeks, we're gonna see things like daycare facilities reopening, as well as in July, uh, day camps are gonna be allowed to open. And that includes municipal day camps. Of course, it will be up to, I think, the specific uh, provider of them as to whether or not they're going to reopen. So make sure if you're, that's something you're interested in, um, you check out the specific camp that you're looking at to make sure they are gonna reopen. Um, additionally, the governor is planning more announcements this week 
about things reopening. Um, and if we look at you know, our states around us, that's probably gonna include restaurants, um, at least for outdoor seating. You know, we don't have any specific dates to give you yet, but that's one thing that's starting to open in other places. Um, and I would assume that that's gonna be a, a, similar, um, a similar trend in New Jersey as well. So we are slowly reopening um, and we will you know, continue to keep you updated as more things reopen and hopefully life can become a little more normal uh, in these challenging times. So with that quick update, I wanna turn it over to Olivia who's gonna be talking about the Coalition for the Delaware River Watersheds DEIJ uh, toolkit that they recently released. Thanks, Drew. Um, so yeah, I am very excited that the Coalition for the Delaware River Watershed recently released our Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Justice Toolkit, which I'll call DEIJ for brevity's sake going forward. Um, re and it is currently in our member comment period that will be done on June 4th, and then it'll be released out on our website um, for anyone to see. So the there's a work group within the Coalition for the Delaware River Watershed that work, is focused on DEIJ, and they have behind the scenes for many, many months been working on this toolkit, trying to draft what's going to be included into it, adding the language. Um, and then within the past couple of, or the later months of last year, we made a big push to add all the uh, details and all the extra wording that needed to go in. And then we've spent the last couple of months um, up until just recently going through a pretty robust review process. Um, and it's finally ready to go out to the coalition membership and then very soon the general um, world, which is very exciting. So this toolkit is our first volume. It's focusing specifically on internal organization practices. Um, so it's really um, well geared towards what organizations throughout the watershed, like environmental nonprofits and things of that nature are doing within their organizations to promote equity and inclusion. So there's a lot of different points that we hit. Um, we go into the importance of DEIJ, why it matters for organizations um, to be committed to, and then looking at the way that organizations are structured um, and how to create different inclusive spaces uh, going through a whole host of topics such as bias and um, tokenism, welcoming gender and sexuality into the workplace, different disability inclusion ideas, and then it finishes off with um, recruitment and retention points. So it is pretty um, wide in the things that it covers, but it's all still grounded in that idea of what's happening internally at different organizations um, as they go forward in their journey. So it is a pretty meaty toolkit. It's just under 37 full pages. So there's a ton of information in there. Um, and as I said, we're currently in our member comment period. So that's been open for about a week and a half so far. Um, we kicked off the member comment period with a webinar explaining some of the things about the toolkit. And so far the feedback that we've gotten from folks has been um, resoundingly positive and people throughout our coalition are really excited to be using um, the toolkit. So that is really great and we're excited for it to go out um, to the public as well. Excellent. Olivia, one question I have for you. Um, why, you know, can you explain a little bit about why it's important to focus on internal practices first and foremost? Yeah, so the decision to make this focus specifically on internal practices was intentional by the DEH, DEIJ work group for two reasons. Um, the first and foremost is that for a lot of organizations who are embarking on um, diversity and inclusion work, there's this internal um, urge to go to external programming first. So getting new volunteers, getting new membership, going into different communities that they haven't, or organizations haven't been working with um, in the past. Um, but because that of that internal urge to go to action first, a lot of mistakes can happen with the language that folks are using or not being cognizant of the issues that are being faced by different communities that they're trying to access. So by focusing internally, you can make sure that your organization is well-versed in different like language, what terminology to use, and also that you have equitable practices. So when you bring folks 
from different communities that you haven't been working with before into your organization, they're still being um, included and their voices are being heard rather than um, kind of ignoring their wishes or their voices and not actually making it an inclusive environment. Because when that happens, then the new folks who that organization spent a lot of time attracting and bringing in are going to leave if they don't feel as though they're being valued within the organization. Thanks so much, Olivia. I mean, you know, especially with everything going on in our country and how this work I think is more important than ever. Um, and I think just, I wanna give you kind of a softball and I think you've already answered it a little bit, but um, you know, really explicitly, if some organization comes up to you and says, why do I need to care about this? You know, my mission is X, Y, or Z. You know, I'm a conservation organization. That's my first thing, or I'm whatever organization you want to put in there. I'm not a, you know, diversity, equity, and justice organization. Um, so why should I care about this? Yeah, so a way that someone had explained this to me when we were trying to um, specifically work on that section about the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion is that no matter what nonprofit or organization you are in general, your core mission is to build a community around a certain topic. So for a lot of environmental organizations, it's about providing a community around land conservation or improving the Delaware River watershed or engaging outdoor recreators. But whatever that mission is, even if it's not explicitly stated, a nonprofit is only as strong as the membership that it has. Um, so if you are not being able to reach everyone in the community around you to engage them in land preservation or whatever you may have, then your mission isn't actually being achieved. Um, so it is pretty vital that you're taking the time to engage in being inclusive and having equitable practices in your organization, because even if you think that, that your mission is land preservation, your mission is land preservation through the engagement of volunteers or memberships or getting folks um, engaged in that work. Um, so if you want people to be engaged, you need to make sure that they feel welcome. Um, and that is why this work is important for really any organization that you are that is forward facing in any sort of capacity. Excellent. Well, thanks, Olivia. I'm, I'm so excited to see what else is, you know, coming down the road with all of this work with the coalition and New Jersey Audubon, especially. Um, so, yeah, thanks for all your work. And I know the DEIJ work group has done a lot to move this forward as well. Thanks, Sandra, for those kind words. And yeah, I would love to give another shout out to CDRW's DEIJ work group. They were really um, essential in the crafting of this toolkit, and I'm excited to work with them on the second volume, focusing on external facing practices. Uh, but then to close this episode, as you know, we like to do, um, I'm going to ask Drew, Drew, what are you sending your coworkers during Zoom meetings that are going just a little too long? So uh, mine's kind of like a general recommendation and that's, you know, going back to things that are, you know, especially in these times that are really stressful, everything's really new, going back to something that's familiar to you, that you know, um, and one of those for me, I've been a big nerd and I've you know, talked with Sandra, for instance, quite a bit about this, both on and off of Zoom meetings, is Harry Potter. Um, and so that's just one of those things, and it might be something completely different for you, but finding that uh, thing that's familiar, you know, I'm through, I'm just finishing up book seven again, so going through everything, <laughs> uh, you know, and I play a stupid Harry Potter game on my phone uh, and everything, so but that's like one of those familiar things to me that's a little bit of escapism, but also um, is comforting and something that I'm, you know, really, um, yeah, I said familiar with again. And that just, I think, helps with the, the craziness of these times where so much is uncertain to go back to that. So that's what I'm going to suggest for everybody. Awesome, Drew. That sounds great. Um, and with that, our episode concludes. So thanks everyone for watching and we'll catch you again next week.